of the practices from the Pacific Islands that I find most intriguing is map making from the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands see themselves as being the greatest navigators in the world and one of the things that you can see as a material representation of this is the wonderful maps. They're called Medo or Rebelib and they're made of sticks and shells and put together as mental maps of the Marshall Islands and the currents and the swells that link those islands. But the maps aren't used in the way that we use GPS in a car currently or the way that we used to use a paper map. These aren't things that the navigators would have taken with them in boats. This is a memory aid. So it's a thing that will help you to create a mental map, a really good solid map so it was only ever used on shore. The Marshall Islands represents an enormous number of islands and atolls in the Pacific and it's the first major island group that you reach if you're traveling southwest from Hawaii. The Marshall Islands are a set of 29 atolls made up of 1,200 roughly islands and it takes up a space of about 2 million square kilometers. And this is almost all water. It's so interesting that this is a map not of land, but it's a map of the relationship between land and sea. The sea is very much the element that Marshall Islanders live with all the time. It's a very intimate part of who they are and their daily lives and their cosmologies. And this ocean links them. It's the unifying element. I think of the ocean as a barrier, but mm. this is the reverse. The ocean That's is right. the thing that creates a relationship between the atolls and the islands. The great Tongan scholar Apeli Hawofa has written very eloquently and powerfully about this, that this is our sea of islands, the way they're all connected, they're connected by the ocean, they're not separate. I love that the cowrie shells represent the islands, and they're really small. Most of the chart is wood, it's sticks. It beautifully expresses how isolated those islands are, but brought together within this greater matrix of the wood, of the ocean. Each one of these charts is different because it's made by a navigator to represent the way he sees this ocean with its islands and how to get between them. And this one here is one that was collected by Robert Louis Stevenson. The author. That's right. He and his family travelled to the Marshalls. He bought this here or was given it and then later on it was sold in his estate. It seems impossible that you could create a map of the open ocean, but the way that these function, in a general sense, is that they're registering the swells, the currents, the landmarks of the open sea. In most of the charts you'll see there's these curving sticks. Those ones are like the echoes of the swells and the waves out from an island. So when they hit an island, they then echo back out. And then you can see the longer sticks are the ones which are currents, and there's also sticks which are like the pathways from one place to another that the navigators wanted to emphasize. It makes sense that the chart is recording the way in which the water is responsive to the islands since these islands are low and probably can't be seen until you're right up against them. And that's one of the great skills of Marshallese and other Micronesian navigators is that as soon as you're just a little way beyond your atoll, your island, you can't see landforms anymore. You really have to just be able to read the sea. And it's a reminder of how treacherous the ocean could be for somebody who was not a skilled navigator and how important passing knowledge from a senior navigator to somebody who's just learning that craft really is. The master navigators would take the young men out on the canoes and they would have them lie down on the canoe and feel the waves and you can feel when there's one current intersecting another and you can feel the way the boat rocks differently and these are very beautifully designed outrigger canoes and they're very highly attuned to their specific lagoon and sea environment and work in all sorts of difficult sailing conditions. And that relationship with the sea is changing rapidly now. The big issue for the Marshall Islanders now is climate change. Here in the past it's been nuclear testing. So in the 1940s and the 1950s this was a place where the United States tested its hydrogen bombs, most famously at the Bikini Atoll. Marshall Islanders are still living with that legacy and there's still testing going on but not of nuclear weapons. It's more you know, ballistic missiles now. But part of what has come out of that is that there's this compact of free association between the Marshall Islands and the United States, which means that the people from the Republic of the Marshall Islands can actually live and work in the States. One can only imagine what a contemporary map would look like now, one that spanned not only islands but actually nations. Certainly these maps are now fulfilling a very different role. They're much more about navigating identities and connections to place. They are put on people's walls. So if it's someone from Madro, you know, the capital of the Marshalls moves out to New York, they might take one of these. So I've been working with Tina Steggy from the Marshall Islands for a number of years and she wrote a beautiful piece to talk about climate change and I just wanted her to, to read it out for us. I called this, We Are Navigating Threatening Seas. 
Our ancestors sailed to the Marshall Islands over 1,000 years ago in canoes. It was a feat of wayfinding that sustains and inspires those of us now looking for a way forward in threatening seas. This is also a story of our children and the generations to come. What will it mean to them to be Marshallese? Will they know the names of their home islands and the wado, the land parcels that bind us to the earth and to each other? Will they think of the ocean as a part of themselves? Will it be a source of sustenance and a vast network of waves, each with names, leading like roads to other islands? Will they know the smell of mao, the pandanus fiber we use to weave everything, clothing mats, baskets, the small flowers we wear in our hair? What will the world be like for them?